everybody, it's Capper, and we're here with episode number five of the Medical Cases Podcast, and today I'm going to be talking about intubating using the glide scope and how to troubleshoot. But before we start off with the episode, I just want to say thank you to all of our viewers worldwide. I've been getting a lot of downloads from Pakistan, Nepal, from New Zealand, and Australia, and I just wanted to say that I appreciate all of you, and if you have any questions or comments, you can always check out our website, which is linked to in the description on the podcast app, or you can check us out on Facebook. Now, the actual podcast. So what inspired this was a case that I had in the trauma bay, which is where we send all of our traumas. It was a patient that was involved in a motor vehicle collision. It was fairly severe. It was a 50-ish year old male. They were in a C collar and they were slightly overweight. So C collars on, patients not fully responsive. The decision was made to intubate. Now, I'm not going to be talking about whether you should use video or use direct laryngoscopy for your first pass. That's an entire another podcast in itself. But for this patient, I chose to use the GlideScope to intubate. One, because that is our main video laryngoscope that we have in the emergency department. We also have something called the King Vision which is a channeled video laryngoscope. However, the GlideScope is more easily accessible in our trauma bay. And just to be more accurate, the actual model that we're using is the GlideScope AVL disposable laryngoscope. And now this is the model that I've seen at several different hospitals that I've worked at. So at least from what I've seen, it seems to be one of the more common GlideScopes that's out there. Now, the patient was GCS below 8 and the decision was made to intubate. I went first past with the 3 GlideScope blade and I was able to get a great view, a grade 1 Cormac Lehane view of the cords, but I had difficulty passing the tube. So I was able to visualize the tube very well on my screen. However, I couldn't get the tube to go anteriorly enough or vertically, if you will, if you're looking at the screen, but anterior according to the patient's anatomy. So after pulling back on the joystick, which is the rigid stylet, I was still unable to get that tube anteriorly enough to get it through the cords. And after trying for a little bit, one of the residents called out and said, hey, capper, try popping the stylet, meaning Take your thumb, push up on the stylet, and withdraw just the stylet a couple centimeters. Now, I had remembered that he had told me before about this little trick. So what it actually does is by popping the stylet slightly, it allows your tube, and now just the tube, because remember the tip doesn't have the stylet anymore, just that tube can advance and it actually causes the tube to angle anteriorly or angle vertically, once again according to the screen, but anteriorly to the patient's anatomy, it it angles it up more, allowing me to pass the tube easily through the cords and it was a successful first pass intubation on a trauma patient with the glide scope. So kind of doing a debrief with my colleague in the doc box, which is the room where we have many discussions and where the doctors all do their charting. We were talking about different techniques that he uses and that I use to troubleshoot using the glide scope. And what came of this was actually a journal club where we went over two different articles. The first article is entitled Tips and Troubleshooting for Use of the GlideScope Video Laryngoscope for Emergency Endotracheal Intubation. And the second article is entitled A Deliberately Restricted Laryngeal View with the GlideScope Video Laryngoscope is Associated with Faster and Easier Tracheal Intubation when Compared with a Full Glottic View, a Randomized Clinical Trial. So to talk about both of these articles, well, the first one, this Randomized Clinical Trial They took 163, now these are elective surgical patients, and they divided them into two groups. The first group where they used a full laryngeal view, or a Cormac Lehane grade 1 view. Now in the second group, they purposefully gave the patient a restricted view, 
which they called less than 50% of the glonic opening was visible. So that would be a cormac lehane 2 view. And after looking at this, they found that for the restricted group, the median time to intubation was 27 seconds, and it was 36 seconds, so longer in the patients with the full view. However, interesting to note, no significant difference between first pass success rate, oxygenation, saturation, post-intubation, or complications. However, this is fairly interesting, right? They purposefully gave themselves a restricted, a less than 50% of glottic opening visible view, and they were able to intubate faster. So here we go. First way, number one, you can try giving yourself a deliberately restricted laryngeal view if you're having trouble intubating with the glide scope. Now, I wouldn't go ahead and say that, oh, you should always use the deliberately restricted view. I don't know if one randomized control trial is enough to say that, but look, it's fairly easy, or at least in my experience, if you give yourself the full view, you can back off just a little bit with the glide scope and give yourself a slightly more restricted view. I don't find any major drawbacks to moving the glide scope slightly in and out to give yourself a different view. Now, before we get into the second article, which is one that gives us a bunch of good tips in troubleshooting, I want to go through the algorithm that the official Glidescope YouTube video discusses. And this is actually a really good video, and I highly recommend watching it for anybody that is going to use the Glidescope. Just search Glidescope Intubation on YouTube, and it's the official video from the Glidescope Video Laryngoscope channel. Um, and what they talk about here is a four-step method. So they say, one, look at the mouth. That's look at the mouth to introduce the laryngoscope. Now the Glidescope laryngoscope is introduced midline without any swiping of the tongue. So one, look at the mouth. Two, look at the screen. You look at the screen to obtain the best glottic view. Now that's interesting. The verbiage that they chose is actually Quote, obtain best glottic view. Now, this is somewhat contrary to what this previous article said, mentioning that a deliberately restricted view might actually be beneficial. They go on further to mention that the tip of the Glidescope laryngoscope can actually be positioned in the vallecula or in the posterior surface of the epiglottis, kind of similar to a Mac, a curved blade, or a Miller, the straight blade. You can use it either way. They also mention that the glottic aperture should take up the upper one-third of the screen and that you can add slight minimal lift, anterior lift, to the actual device itself, kind of how you would lift a straight or a curved blade but they do use the word minimal lift. So that's step two, right? Step one, look at the mouth. Step two, look at the screen. Step three, look back at the mouth. So this is something I asked around, asked some of the residents, and not all of them do this, right? When you intubate with a direct laryngoscope, what is one of the teachings they always say? Once you get the good view of the cords, don't take your eyes off the cords. You have a good view, don't take your eyes off. Well, the glide scope is a little bit different. When you're using the glide scope, after you've gotten a good grade one view of the cords, more than likely you're not going to lose that view. With the glide scope, little tiny variations of movement tend not to make as big of a difference in your view when compared to direct laryngoscopy. When you're doing direct laryngoscopy, even the slight movement or taking your eyes off the cords for a second can result in you losing your view or even accidentally changing your view from looking at the cords to maybe looking at the esophagus. And when you go to pass the tube, you might think, oh, hey, there's my opening again and accidentally goose the tube or put the tube in the esophagus. Now, Step three, look at the mouth. So, one more time. One, look at the mouth. Two, look at the screen. Three, look at the mouth again to insert the ET tube. Now, they mention here that you should be watching the distal tip of the endotracheal tube until it's close 
to the tip of the laryngoscope, and this is one way to troubleshoot one of the major problems with the GlideScope, which is getting the endotracheal tube into the mouth and getting it in view of the camera. I initially had some problems with this, and it was because I was keeping my eyes on the screen, on the video screen, and this is not what you are supposed to do according to the actual instructions from GlideScope, from Verathon Corporation. So I've had several people tell me, oh, you can't take your eyes off that screen. Well, that is not true and not the recommended way to use the GlideScope. So step three, look at the mouth and get that endotracheal tube in. Finally, look back at the screen. They mentioned that you should be looking at the screen, obviously, for when you're passing the tube through the cords. So step one, look at the mouth to introduce the laryngoscope. Step two, look at the screen to obtain the best glottic view, or possibly consider a deliberately restricted glottic view. Step three, look at the mouth again to insert the ET tube. And then finally, look at the screen so that you can pass the endotracheal tube through the cords. They also mention here that, quote, sometimes a slight withdrawal of the glide scope is required to reduce the viewing angle, allowing for the glottis to drop. And I believe what Verathon is hinting at here is this concept that the article had already mentioned, that sometimes backing up on the glide scope and restricting your view can actually help with intubation. So there you go, tips one through three. One, consider a deliberately restricted view. Two, Use the one, two, three, four step method, which we just went over, which is on the official YouTube page for GlideScope. And then number three is I want to further emphasize that you should be looking at the actual endotracheal tube while you are inserting it into the mouth. And for further clarification here, you should be sliding the tip of the endotracheal tube along the underside of the glide scope. Now, there is a device called the McGrath Axe Blade, and all this is is a disposable blade that goes over the McGrath Mac video laryngoscope, and it has something called the ET contact zone, and all this is is that little lip on the right side of the disposable part of the laryngoscope, similar to the lip that the glide scope has, that lip is labeled, and it's labeled in yellow with a little arrow that is down sweeping, and it says ET contact zone. And what I like about looking at this McGrath X-Blade, now mind you, I've never used it, and I only really like looking at it for this one purpose, which is to illustrate this concept that while you're passing the endotracheal tube into the mouth, before you have it on the video screen, it should be contacting the actual laryngoscope, the video laryngoscope, whether it be this McGrath X-Blade or the GlideScope, the entire time. Now, kind of a brief interlude, I just want to get it out of the way. I do not support one of these video laryngoscopes more than the other, and I do not take any money from any of them. It's just that when you are talking about video laryngoscopes, you're going to have to use the brand names. They're going to come up, especially when you're talking about all the subtle differences between each one. Now, back to it. Tip number four is to practice. And this is a very important tip, and it's the very first one that's mentioned in the article talking about troubleshooting for the glide scope and it seems somewhat self-explanatory that you have to practice but i have noticed in multiple different hospitals that i've worked at that sometimes there is a anti-video laryngoscope sentiment something along the lines of oh well you don't know how to use a direct laryngoscope you have to cheat with the video laryngoscope well there is nothing about the video laryngoscope that is cheating. And even saying that it's cheating, somehow implying that it's easier, well, if it is something that's easier, then why wouldn't you want to use that more often? Wouldn't you want to use the device and be familiar with the device that makes a procedure safer? And don't take me wrong here, I'm not saying that there is definitive evidence suggesting that one form of laryngoscopy video versus direct is always going to be safer or more effective than the other in every situation. 
All I'm saying is that a lot of the arguments used by people that don't want you to use a video laryngoscope are not valid arguments. Take the one that I hear all the time. Well, what if you don't have a video laryngoscope? Well, first of all, most hospitals will have video laryngoscopes. Second of all, if I were working at a hospital without one, I would purchase one of my own. And then third, look, a regular laryngoscope can fail just as well as a video laryngoscope. Okay, the light can go out. You can have trouble setting it up. I've had this happen more than I've had failures from video laryngoscopes. So look, you can run into problems with either way, and you should be 100% adept and trained using both video and direct laryngoscopy. There is no debate here. It's that you should be good at both ways of intubation. All right, so rant over. Let's get to tip number five, which is another tip on getting the tube into the mouth. If you have a good view but have a problem getting the tube into the mouth, you can always try shifting the entire glide scope, the entire laryngoscope, a little bit to the left. And this will actually give you a little more space in the mouth. So tip number five, shift the entire glide scope to the left a little bit if you have problems getting the tube in the mouth. Tip number six is a very important tip, which is when you are holding the endotracheal tube, if you are using that rigid stylet that comes with the glide scope, you need to be holding it on the distal, the most far away aspect of the tube. It's like a little joystick. It even has some ridges there for your thumb. You should be holding it all the way up there when you are aiming and maneuvering the tube into the cords. It gives you a lever arm and allows for you to position and maneuver that tube with a lot more ease than if you're holding it way, way further down by the patient's mouth. So tip number six, always hold the stylet, the rigid stylet up on that little thumb grip. And tip number seven is if you have difficulty passing the ET tube through the cords, you can always withdraw the stylet three to five centimeters. Now, this is what I did during my difficult trauma intubation, but withdrawing the stylet can be used for two issues. The first one is the issue that I had. When I was pulling back on the joystick, if you will, pulling as far back on the rigid stylet, trying to force the tube anterior to reach those cords, I was still unable to get enough anterior hyperangulation of that tube to get it into the cords. So what I did was I just popped the stylet off a little bit, kind of allowing that tube to shift up further. So that's one way that you can use this. The way that they mention in the article is for another issue, which is where you are able to get the stylet and the tube into the cords. However, due to the hyperangulation of the rigid stylet, you're actually impacting the anterior portion of the trachea and it's not allowing you to advance that tube. And what they recommend here is once again to withdraw the stylet. So it's almost like the same solution for two opposite problems. One, in my case, was that I didn't have enough hyperangulation, and while pulling back on the rigid stylet, I still wasn't able to get anteriorly enough, versus the other problem, which is the excess hyperangulation of that rigid stylet causes you to impact the anterior or uppermost, when the patient's laying down, uppermost portion of the trachea, kind of cramming your endotracheal tube into the trachea and not allowing you to follow its natural curvature. So tip number seven, if you're having problems passing the ET tube through the cord, you can always remove the stylet three to five centimeters. And that's it, seven tips to help you get better at intubating with the glide scope. Let's recap. Tip number one, consider a deliberately restricted laryngeal view when intubating with a glide scope. Tip number two, follow the one through four step approach that is recommended by Verathon, the makers of the glide scope. And what is this again? It's one, look at the mouth, 
two, look at the screen, three, look back at the mouth, and then four, look at the screen again. So one, look at the mouth to introduce the laryngoscope, two, look at the screen to obtain the best glottic view, then three, look at the mouth. So take your eyes off the screen, and while introducing the endotracheal tube, you should be looking at the actual laryngoscope and tracing the lip of the laryngoscope with the tip of the ET tube. So three, look at the mouth, and then finally look back at the screen. Obviously, you're going to need to look at the screen to pass the tube. So that was tip number two. Tip number three, look at the mouth. Once again, reiterating, when you put that tube in, you should be looking at the mouth. And I'll add one little thing here. Sometimes just applying a little pressure to the patient's lip, just pulling their lip out of the way, if you're having trouble passing that tube through the mouth, can allow you to get the tube in. Just go on and have an assistant or even yourself just stick one finger in their mouth and pull the lips out of the way. So tip number four, practice. The only way that you're going to get good at video laryngoscopy is by practicing. Don't let the people tell you, oh, it's cheating. Oh, you should use the other techniques first and be proficient at them. You should be proficient at both techniques. And I've spoken with a lot of residents who just don't feel comfortable with video laryngoscopy because of this anti-VL sentiment. So tip number four, practice. Tip number five, consider shifting the entire laryngoscope to the left a little bit if you're having trouble passing the tube through the mouth. Tip number six, hold the endotracheal tube towards the top, towards the most distal end, if you will, the part that's furthest away from the patient's mouth, where that little grip is on the rigid stylet is where you should be holding the actual endotracheal tube. And then finally, tip number seven, if you're having trouble passing the endotracheal tube through the cords, consider popping the stylet and withdrawing it three to five centimeters. And that's it for the podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. And I hope you can use this in your clinical practice. If you have any feedback, just check me out on Facebook. Check out the website. You can always comment there. And as always, I appreciate every single one of my listeners. You have a great day now. Capper out.